Hello and welcome to day 11 of the My Tehillim Time Omer edition, where we are counting up to the excitement of Shavuot. It's getting really close, guys. Each day or night, depending on where you are, we have the opportunity together to delve into another parak of Tehillim, see its connection to the Sefira for the day. And today, we focus on Hod, glory, beauty, and grandeur. Orly Wabahir, founder of Abraham's Legacy, where our mission is to create technology that enables us to serve Hashem as one. And the Abraham's Legacy Tehillim app is a unique app that's created in memory of my grandfather, Allah Vashalom, Avraham Ben Polin. And it allows people from across the globe to complete books of Tehillim in unison in real time and currently in four languages. With over a million chapters of Tehillim read, just shy of 20,000 members, this is an incredible community dedicated to connecting further to the power of Tehillim. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you here, and I hope you get to learn more about Abraham's legacy and how you could get involved. And for our incredible regulars, welcome back. Please, I want to encourage all of you to help us spread the word and share about this program with your friends, with your family. Even if they can't attend live, they can, of course, watch the replay, which is available. We're going to be going strong until May 22nd, right up until Shavuot. And you could see our entire agenda at abrahamslegacy.com slash sign up, where you'll receive then an email reminder prior to each talk. And like I said, not to worry if you missed a few along the way, all of them are recorded. They're uploaded to our YouTube channel, to our website, and they're all available from 24 hours after each event. So we have yet another wonderful speaker for tonight. But before that, I want to just thank all of you for taking the time to be here live with us. I'm here in Eretz Yisrael in Yerushalayim, and it is Lag Ba'omer. Uh, you might be coming from different places, and it's going to be Lag Ba'omer this evening. So it's a very, very special night that we're, we're here together celebrating. I also want to thank Naomi Jerno, who's helped put all of this together. And of course, of course, I want to thank Hashem, the true CEO behind all of this. I feel very, very, very grateful. Tonight's agenda is going to be as follows. We're going to hear from our incredible speaker, Rebbe Tzim Kineret Sarah Cohen, on the topic of the continuity of the Jewish people. And we're going to focus on chapter 83. So feel free to grab your Abraham's Legacy app to go to chapter 83 or grab your, your Tehillim book. For those who have any questions, you can be sure to list your questions. You'll have the opportunity to ask after the talk. And right after the talk, don't go anywhere. Stay on because we're going to wrap up with an inspiring six-minute Tehillim read through the Abraham's Legacy app. This is, this is a unique experience for those of you that have not experienced it. I want to encourage all of you to join. So grab your smartphone if you have, if you have one. And download the app. It's for free. Search for Abraham's Legacy. Or you could click on the link that's going to be in the chat. Don't worry because I'm going to be showing a quick video before we have the read in case it's your first time doing this. And in six minutes, Bezrat Hashem. We'll have the opportunity to complete a book of Tehillim, or maybe even more, but we need as many people as possible to participate. So uh, be sure to stay tuned for that after our talk. As we all know, as I mentioned, tonight is the Hilla of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So something to mention, we have a really beautiful project to honor Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that's currently going on, and you can take part. We have, of course, as some of you know, maybe some of you don't know, we have our 100% pure copper and teal cups. This is going to be part of the raffle that's going to be going on on May 22nd, for those of you that are involved in the raffle. And you have the opportunity to have a personal engraving. This is one, for example, I'm just bringing, I'm going to be bringing this one to the Kotel this coming Wednesday, Bezrat Hashem, that you can engrave the name of your loved one, whether it's Lilui Nishmat, like over here, whether it's for Rafu Ashlema, on the Nitila cup, and it will be placed at the kever of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We only have 20 Nitila cups available for this opportunity. So if you're interested, you can reach out at the link in the chat or in the emails that you get sent. You'll also have contact information there. Now, finally, we're on to our main attraction, and I am honored to introduce today's speaker, Rebetzin Kineret Sarah Cohen. Rebetzin is she's known for her, the, the Jew, in the Jewish music world as the foremost orthodox female Jewish performer. And not only does she use her voice to create joy, as you'll all see, she creates joy in the hearts of women through her singing, but it's also through her power of speech. She lectures and spreads Torah all over the world. And the Rabbanit's objective is to instill into the hearts and souls of Jewish women a love for Torah, a love for Hashem, 
and to strengthen our emunah, our bitachon, such an important thing. She was born in Eretz Yisrael. The Rabbanit is of Sephardic descent. She's Moroccan. And she grew up in New York in Ashkenazic circles and developed a deep connection to the teachings of Hasidut and Musar. Because of her diverse upbringing, she's able to connect, to teach, and to understand women who come from many different types of backgrounds or religious affiliations. Her skills as a certified life coach have helped women unlock their hidden potential, their strengths, their talents, as they experience life's challenges. I'm going to place the link in the chat. It's also in the email that you received for more information about a life coaching, a live a coaching session with the Rabbanit. Or you can also visit ohelsarad.com. I'll put the link in the chat in just a moment. You should know that renowned rabbis, Rabbi David Abu Hatzer Ashlita, Rabbi David Achanania uh, Pinto, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, Alava Shalom, Rabbi Moshe Ben uh, Moshe Shlita, and Rabbi Moshe Chaim Simantov have encouraged her to proceed forward in this mission of Ruchaniyut and have blessed her journey. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Rabbitson Kineret Sarah Cohen. Thank you so much for being here with us. What an amazing introduction. I should be on your show every single day. Incredible intro. Thank you You're so fantastic. much. Yes, yes. I feel humbled by that introduction. And I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, join your incredible platform. I didn't even know that Abraham's legacy was yours. Now that I see that it's really Louis Nishmat, your father, was it? It's Abraham. my grandfather, my grandfather. Your grandfather, your grandfather. Pauline. Avraham ben Paulin, and Bezat Hashem de Shi'u Sha'o so be Lilu Nishmato. Amen. And Lilu Nishmato be, I mean, could say even in Lilu Nishma and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Alav Shalom. But anything that we learn tonight should be really for the honor of the great sage that we're celebrating. And I actually clo closed all the windows in my house now because right across the street, they're lighting a bonfire very soon and the music is, is going to start. So uh, hopefully we won't hear much, but. It is Lagba Omer here already in Eretz Yisrael, and I thank you all for joining. I uh, chose to speak about a very interesting Perek and Tehilim. Uh, Perek Pei Gimal is actually from the Asaf collection. Shir Mizmor Le Asaf, a psalm, a song of Asaf. Many Chachamim feel that Asaf was one of Korach's sons. Others think he was a fam famous Levi who served in the Beta Migdash. But either way, this Mizmo is a song that he actually composed and it reveals why he wrote it. This Perek is traditionally recited during a major crisis when the world is in a state of disarray and chaos. And especially if enemies, Chaz Shalom wish to attack Am Yisrael. The Perek discusses the various Gentile nations that are attempting to and will try in the future to, God forbid, annihilate Am Yisrael. They want to erase the God of the Jewish people. Hold on a second before I continue. I don't know why, for some crazy, some crazy reason, it's making me the host here and asking me to admit people. Uh, don't worry, sure to... don't worry about that. I'm I'm taking care of it, so that not okay. to worry. It's gonna pop up for you because you are the co-host. But don't worry oh, about it. Great. Okay. I, I was yeah. just worried because I keep admitting people. No, okay. no worry. I'm taking care of it. Okay. The goyim, they want to erase the God of the Jewish people, Chaz Shalom, something we're familiar with in this generation. Now, there's a machloket among the scholars as to which event in history this specific perik is referring to. Much of Tehillim follows events that were chronicled in Tanakh. So it's important for us to know the specific event in history, the catalyst for the composition of this perik, because someone is, after all, davening about something that occurred in our history. So most Mefarshim, including the Malbim, alav shalom, feel that this perik alludes to the era of Melech Yehoshaphat, the king of Malchut Yehuda, who was a very good and righteous man. At that time, B'nai Yisrael was being surrounded by many enemies on all sides. So Melech Yehoshaphat had to lead the people to war. 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a miracle for Yehoshaphat where the Jewish army did not have to engage in battle. His army, Pashut, began to sing the praises of Hashem and wondrously, the enemies began to perish. Interestingly, one of Asaf's descendants was a soldier who accompanied Yehoshaphat on the battlefield. So in this Perek, Asaf was praying for the future success of his ancestors and of Melech Yehoshaphat. Now, regarding this war, the Malbim writes that Ammon and Moab rose up against Bnei Israel to do battle with them. The Imam Hamon Rav, and there was a multitude of nations who joined them to wage war against us. And then the Malbim writes, the Yehoshaphat hit Palel, Yehoshaphat began to pray, the Karatzom, and he sanctioned a fast day. The Yehaziel mean Bne Asaf Haya. And there was a man named Yehaziel who was a descendant of Asaf. He was present over there. That's most likely the connection between the event and Asaf's Perek of Tehillim. But anyhow, Yehaziel had a prophecy and he, started, he shared it with Yehoshaphat. He told Yehoshaphat, Al Tirau, do not be afraid. Ki lo lachem ha milchama. You're not going to be the ones to fight this battle. This war belongs to the Ribbono Shel Olam. Lo lachem lehelachem. It's not for you to do the actual fighting. Yahaziel was telling the Jewish army to stand down because it won't be necessary to engage in a physical battle against the enemies. Now I ask you, how else are they going to be victorious? So Yechaziel tells the people, Imdu ureu et Yeshuat Hashem. Rise and witness the salvation of God. And then the Malbim writes, Vesham siper bedivrei ayamim. In the book of Chronicles we're told, Ech ha'oivim atzmam hargu ze baze. How the enemies were wiping each other out. This battle turned into mayhem on the battlefield of the enemies. The Navi tells us that the enemies became confused and they started attacking each other. A civil war broke out in the encampment of the enemies. And Bnei Israel stood back and watched as the Oivim wiped each other out. And not one soldier in Am Yisrael shot a single arrow. Before we knew it, the entire battle came to an end as Bnei Israel stood there witnessing one of the most miraculous events in Jewish history. These are the words of the Malbim. Now, although this perek was written concerning a future event, Chachamim did not limit the perek to one episode in history. But the perek does become the prototype to Helim to recite whenever there's a national danger from the enemies. So with that introduction in mind, let's analyze the words in this perek. Elokim al damilach, Hashem do not be silent. Rashi HaKadosh Alav HaShalom explains that we're asking Hashem not to be silent when the enemy is coming to annihilate us. Al techerash, do not be silent. Ve'al tishkot el, and do not be silent, Hashem. Do not remain inactive as the enemy approaches. For behold, your enemies are stirring up the action of war. Umsanecha nasurosh, and those who hate you raise their heads against you. Notice the words. Oivecha. Um sanecha. Asaf is concerned about the enemy and he refers to them in two different ways. Oyevecha um sanecha. Who's the oyev and who's the sone? These are two distinct enemies, two different nations that Rabbi Nubachia, Allah Shalom, tells us about, and one is worse than the other. The sone is Asav. Just as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Alav Shalom taught us, 
הלכה היא בידוע שעשיו שונא ליעקב. It's a known maxim that עשיו hates יעקב. But then we're told that although the שונא despises us, he's still not as dangerous as an אויב, if you could believe that. But we're told that the אויב, the enemy is the worse. And the reason why he's called an אויב is because the first three letters of the word אויב, אלבביוד, spells the word oy, oy. In other words, when we come in contact with the oyev, we immediately say, oy, oy, we're in trouble. So who's the oyev over here? Rabbi Nubachi reveals to us that it's Ishmael. Asaf is worried about Hashem Sonim, that's Asaf and the oyevim, that's Ishmael. And we see that concept from a chidush that was written on Megillat Esther. When Esther Malka Lea Shalom invited Ahashverosh and Amman to her second private banquet, she revealed to Ahashverosh that there's an evil man who wants to annihilate her people. And Ahashverosh is surprised. He says, Mi huze ve'ezehu? Who is this man? And Esther says, Ish tsar ve'oyev haman hara hazeh. an adversary and an enemy, this evil Haman. Now, where are Haman's origins rooted? We all know he's Mizera Amalek. He's a descendant of Amalek. And who's an Amalek a descendant of? He's the grandson of Esav. If Haman is Esav, how did Esther refer to him as an Oyev? Why didn't she refer to him as the Sone? Did Esther Malka make a mistake? Not at all. Esther was a prophetess. But the Gemara of Megillah reveals to us that whenever we see the word hazeh, it means you're pointing. You're pointing at something. You're pointing at someone. So the Gemara tells us that initially, Esther really pointed to Ahashverosh because she knew that he was the adversary who was behind the entire annihilation sinister plot against Am Yisrael. He's the Oyev, the enemy who paid Haman 10,000 silver coins to get the extermination job done. So she was really pointing to Ahashverosh when she said, Ish tsar ve'oyev. But Hashem then sent a malach to move her hand to point to Haman. How did the Gemara know that? The Gemara says because she used the word Oyev. We know she was referring to Ahashverosh because, because he came from the nations of Paras Umadai, and Paras Umadai is Ishmael. So initially Esther pointed to the Oyev, but then Malach came along and moved her hand to point to the Sone, the Haman Rasha. So this Perak of Tehillim is very significant, especially in our generation, where we're now dealing with these two enemies, Esav and Ishmael. And I'll explain to you what that means. Rav Chaim Vital Alav HaShalom wrote that of the four exiles, the final one is the one that we're currently in, Galut Edom. Galut Edom is Esav. Chachamim tell us that Edom is made up of the entirety of North America, Europe, and some of the Western world. They all fall under the flag of Esav. But Rav Chaim Vital had a tradition that was passed down to him from his rabbi, the Holy Ari, HaKadosh, Allah Shalom, who revealed to him that in the end of days, there is going to be a merger between Esav and Ishmael. Rav Chaim Vital writes, when we begin to see Ishmael partner, partnering with Esav, that's an indication that we're nearing the end. Zeo, Mashiach is coming very soon. So they once asked the Gaon of Vilna, Allah Shalom, where the words of Rav Chaim Vital are actually hinted to in the Torah. And the Gaon of Vilna said the following, when Yaakov Avinu, Allah Shalom, was instructed by his father Yitzchak, not to marry a girl from Canaan, Esav piped in and he said, wait a second, but I married a Canaanite woman. Is my father unhappy with this union? Oh, I gotta respect my father, Kavod. What did he do? 
he decided to take an additional wife. Which nation did Asav choose a wife from? He married Ishmael's daughter. Now that wasn't a love marriage. Asav was in the process of a sinister merger. He wanted to create an alliance with Ishmael because he realized that all by himself, he would never be able to triumph against Yaakov. So he partnered with Ishmael in order to have a stronger stand against Yaakov. In this parak of Tehilim, Asaf was concerned about what would happen if the Sone and the Oyev come together. Now the Zohar Kadosh states that each nation is represented by a specific animal. Asav is represented by the shor, the ox. Ishmael is represented by the chamo, the donkey. Interestingly, the Torah HaKadoshah prohibits us from using an ox and a donkey together in order to plow our fields, which means we could use two oxen or we could use two donkeys, but we cannot use the ox and the donkey together. Hmm, that's strange. Who cares what animals I use to plow my field? Well, there are many reasons given, but the Mekubalim explain that when you put a show and a hamor together, it strengthens the bond of evil. It solidifies the partnership between Ishmael and Esav. So even a minor act like putting these two animals together to plow your field has a spiritual effect. So what happened with Yaakov in the Torah? After Yaakov worked for Lavan for many years, he decided to return to Eretz Canaan, to his homeland. And he knew he'd have to confront his brother Esav. So he sent messengers to Esav saying, Im Lavan garti. Esav, you should know that I lived with Lavan for many years. Vayehi lishor v'chamor. And I acquired oxen and donkeys. So why would Esav care what kind of animals Yaakov acquired? So the Mekubalim explain that when Yosef HaTzadik Alav HaShalom was born to Yaakov, he was referred to by Yaakov as the Shor, the ox of Kedusha from the side of holiness. When Yisachar was born to Yaakov, he was referred to by Yaakov as the Hamor Garim, a strong bone donkey. So Yaakov was telling Asav, you think that because you married into Ishmael's family, you have a strong alliance, but I too have a shor and a Hamor. I have the ox of Kedusha and the donkey that's strong from the side of spirituality and learning. So if you plan to do battle with me, I'm ready. Ladies, the neutralization of Asav and Ishmael's alliance is the Kedusha of Yosef and the Torah of Yisachar. But let me explain this idea to you from an even deeper perspective. What does this alliance of Asav and Ishmael really mean? When the Torah speaks of Ishmael and Asav, they're referring to really various lifestyles and behaviors of each of them. Asav is known for the industrialization of the world, for the great cities, bridges, and buildings that they erected. Asav is very technologically advanced. He's very structured. He's very calculated. Now, Chachamim tell us, despite the evil Asav inflicted on the world, he's still able to have a semblance of civility. If he did not have a modicum of civility, then all his industrious efforts could be used to destroy the entire world. The civility of the sone balances him and keeps him at bay. Ishmael, the Oyev, though, is different. Ishmael is referred to as an unbridled nation. He's a pere adam. His nature is not disciplined. 
He's not domesticated. Ishmael is not as industrious or as advanced as Esav. And the Chafetz Chaim, Alav Shalom, wrote that Baruch Hashem, that Ishmael doesn't have the ability to be an industrial superpower, because if he did, that unbridled nature would destroy the entire world. But guess what? Chachamim foretold that in the end of days, Ishmael will manage to become an industrialized nation. Suddenly be, they'll begin to build and produce and become technologically developed. We see that today. And it was of great concern to the Chachamim. Now the merger between Asav and Ishmael is not just about a physical alliance. It also means that Ishmael will adopt the strengths of Esav in order to become an independent power, which is also something we see today. The danger is of the Oyev employing the kohot of the Sone, making him increasingly powerful. That is Asaf's concern in this perik. He says, that's the danger. It's when the sone becomes rosh, when he'll become a world leader and a head of state. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you something that's confusing now. Rav Chaim of Elijah and Elijah Shalom once spoke on the Gemara of Gitin that states the following. Whoever torments the Jewish people is going to become a head of state, a leader. Huh? That doesn't sound like a very positive thing. Why would Hashem make these people heads of state or world leaders if they're tormenting us? So Rav Chaim explains something incredible based on the words of Shlomo HaMelech Halava Shalom in Sefer Mishle. The heart of kings is like rivulets of water in God's hands. Whatever Hashem wishes, He turns it. He turns their hearts. Which means that God controls the heads of state. They think they have free will, but they don't have it to a great degree. Once you become a rosh, a leader of any country, God will guide and direct you to his own end. So Rav Chaim said, whoever torments Am Yisrael is going to be placed in a, in a position of leadership. Why? In order to keep that leader bridled and under the will of Hashem, because otherwise the torment would know no bounds. So in order to harness the rampant powers of such a person, God turns him into a world leader or some head of state in order to restrain him, in order to remove from him some of his bechira chovshit. And that's a blessing. That's what the Pasuk and Teilim is telling us over here and more. What is the, what was the, the rest of the Teilim? Al amecha ya'arimu sod. They plot with their trickery and quietly against your nation, and they take counsel against what's tzafun, against what's hidden. What's, what does that mean? What's hidden within each and every one of us? Our neshamot, our souls. So Asaf is saying, these enemies are plotting to attack the Jewish soul. The goyim know that the secret of Jewish continuity is our Torah, is our neshama, is our kedusha. That's what keeps us distinct and separate from the other nations of the world. It's the soul of the Jewish people that's bound to the Torah that makes us eternal. They could try to destroy our bodies, but they cannot destroy the Jewish soul because it's eternal. But that's their mission, to attack what's hidden, tsefunecha, which is our souls. And you see that throughout history, by the way. 
before our enemies physically attacked us, what do they always used to do first? First, they burn our sfarim, destroy the shuls, the, burn the sifrei Torah lo'alenu. They got rid of all our religious articles. Why? Because the goyim understood, understood that that's the secret of Am Yisrael. The words in our sfarim keep us connected to Hashem, to our life source, to all that's spiritual and eternal, which is beyond this material world. And that's what this perak is telling us. Amru, the Gentiles say, migoy. Come, let us destroy them from being a distinct nation. Ladies, these words are very significant because notice the next words in the pasuk. And the name of Israel will no longer be remembered. They don't want Israel around anymore because we represent the nation of El, of God, and of the religious and spiritual element. The going, they're going to plot together. You know, there are many times when nations that are sworn enemies of one another can align together when they have a common enemy. And they do so for what reason? What the Pasuk and Teilim says. When they signed their treaties and documents of peace between each other, it's actually a war against spirituality. They can't handle the fact that Jews bring a conscience to the world, that we have a strong value system and a life lived with morals. So notice what the next pasuk states. The tents of Edom and Ishmael. That's the treaty that Asaf is concerned about. The treaty between the Sone and the Oyev. And with them are other nations who want to join in order to break Am Yisrael. Who joins Edom and Ishmael? Look at the Psukim of Tehilim. Moab ve Hagrim. We know who Moab is. Who are these Hagrim? The Farshim say that the descendants of Hagar, the Egyptian. And guess what? There are more who join the alliance. Geval, who are the Jordanians. The Amon, the Amalek, we know who that is. Peleshet, the Pelishtim, we know who they are. Im Yoshveitsur, with the inhabitants of Tyr. As Bekitsur, the entire United Nations joins together to do battle against Am Yisrael. But you know who else joins the alliance? Gam Ashur Nilva Imam. Even Ashur joins the alliance. Who's Ashur that he receives a special mention? Even Ashur joins the alliance as if to say, oh, that's a big deal. So Chachamim tell us that just when we thought that Ashur was the good guy, an ally, boom, he turns his back on us. Who is Ashur? Well, we have to refer to the Torah for that. By the way, ladies, this is the way we have to learn Tehilim. <laughs> With all the sources of Tanakh laid out in front of us. So in Sefer Bereshit, the Torah discusses Nimrod. Remember him, the king of Babel, who denounced Hashem and waged a rebellion against him? He's the one who threw Avraham Avinu Alav Shalom into the fiery furnace for having faith in Hashem. Nimrod is the personification of his name, which is Mered, to rebel. Now, Nimrod had tremendous clout in the world at that time, yet many followers. And the Psukim tell us that Ashur was a fellow countryman of Nimrod. But Ashur left his country. He left Babel. Why? Rashi Kadosh tells us, that when Ashur saw that his children were obeying the words of Nimrod, um bamakom, and they rebe began to rebel against Hashem and build that tower, mitocham, Ashur decided to abandon his own country of birth due to the blasphemous behavior of his fellow citizens. So Ashur seems like a very noble fellow, a very good father. He said, hey, 
Living in Babel is creating a bad influence on my children that I can no longer allow. Enough is enough. I can't raise my children in such a degenerate society of people who rebel against God. So I'm going to have to pick myself up with my entire family, no matter how hard it will be, and settle somewhere else. I'm going to leave this God-forsaken place. Now, in those days, leaving to another area on the world map was difficult because the world was not populated or industrialized as it is today. Moving to a new place meant to a desolate place where you'd physically have to rebuild from scratch. And where did Ashur move to? The Psukim tell us that Ashur built from the ground up the city of Ninveh. Ninveh was the city constructed by Ashur for all those people who were against the policies of Nimrod. So here we go. Ashur uh, seems like a very noble man with honorable goals. That's why, by the way, years later, when the city of Ninveh was committing great sins, HaKadosh Baruch Hu instructed Yonah HaNavi Alav Shalom to warn them to repent within 40 days, lest the city be destroyed. Why did Hashem warn them? Because he wanted to give them a chance to survive because that city was originally erected and populated based on noble intentions. The city of Nineveh was actually a city of spiritual refuge for those who didn't want to follow the regime of Nimrod. That's why Hashem didn't want to destroy Nineveh. And in the end, they repented and they were saved. So Ashur was a good man with good intentions. And he eventually became the nation of Assyria. But what happened? The anti-Semitic views of Ashur that were dormant for many years unexpectedly became pronounced. Suddenly the truth of who Ashur was came to light. And that's what the words in Tehillim are telling us. Gam Ashur nilva imam. Even Ashur, who was originally against Nimrod and his offensive policies, even Ashur, who fought for monotheism and was on the side of God, even Ashur, who fought for the proper values, will join the alliance against Hashem and Bnei Israel. And then Asaf says, Hashem, all these nations will join together in order to chaz v'shalom annihilate us. Please destroy them. Aselahem, do to them. Kemidian, Kesisra, Chayavin, Benachal Kishon. You did away with all those nations and their leaders. Shitemo, Nadivemo, Keorev, Bechizev. Do away with them as you did with those generals, Zorev, Zev. Asher Amru, those people out there, the Goim who said in their time, Nirshalanu et Neotelokim. Where are the ones that are going to inherit the dwellings of God? Elokai, God, shitem galgal, destroy them like a wheel that you roll down a mountain and breaks apart. Hekash lifne ruach, let them be destroyed like straw that blows in the wind. Keesh tivar ya'ar, like a fire that burns in the forest, where if one tree is ignited, the entire forest burns down. Ken tirdefem besa'arecha, let your winds pursue them. Malep nehem kalon, fill their faces with shame. To what end? Vivakshu shimcha Hashem, so that they will finally seek your name. Ivoshu vibalu adead, let them be ashamed and terrified that they didn't choose you. Vyachperu vyovedu, and let, let them be disgraced. ויידעו, and then they'll know, כי אתה שמך השם לבדך, that you are the only one who reigns supreme, אליון על כל הארץ, that you are the most high over all the earth. This parak reminds us that Hashem can suppress the enemy and in a very easy way. And we also see that this parak begins with the words, Shir Mizmor. When we sing the praises of Hashem, it has the ability to sweeten the judgments. 
This parak tells us that the power Am Yisrael has over all the enemies out there is what? Our Kedusha, our holiness, which by the way is our Tzniyot and our Torah. And these days of the Omer, as we count up towards an elevation process to receive the Torah again on Chag HaShavuot, this parak rings true as to what our purpose in the world is which is to maintain our Kedusha and the Torah and how those two spiritual powers can neutralize our Sonim and the Oivim. On this night of Lagba Omer, ladies, as we celebrate the Torah Tanistar, the hidden Torah, the most elevated hidden aspects of Torah that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed to us, may this night teach us the grandeur of what is tzafun within each of us, which is our neshama. That's what the oivim and sonim are attacking, the eternal soul of the Jew. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that I chose this perek, and that the night that I'm teaching this perek is the night of Lagba Omer, the yod site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who taught the most elevated yet hidden parts of Torah. And therefore, the message is very clear. The fire of the Torah Tanistar, the fire of your eternal souls and the Kedusha that you project in the world is what will help us combat the Oivim and the Sonim. In these difficult times of Galut Edom, where the Soneh and the Oyev seem to be joining forces on so many fronts, Asaf was Mosif. He actually added his parakim of Te'ilim in order to assist us in the future, just as he davened in this parak to assist Melech Yehoshaphat. Ladies, Te'ilim is eternal, just as the Torah is eternal, and it's applicable and present in our day and age. Tonight and tomorrow's Yesod is Hod Shebehod, humility of humility. Humility is a midah that helps us achieve great heights because it comes from the side of hiddenness. A humble person is not exposed. A humble person remains modest. Chachamim emphasized the importance of Hod as it applies to this specific day of the Omer, which is the yard site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who is the representative of the character trait of Anava. Humility, Hod. Rabbi Shimon was the foremost Mekubal of the Talmudic era, and he was known for both his deep Torah insights and his learning of Torah. And both the learning of Torah and closeness to God requires humility. In order to arrive at elevated and hidden levels of understanding, we have to first acquire the Yesod of Hod. We have to be humble people. And that means we have to admit that as much as we think we know, there's so much we don't know that's hidden from us. A deep connection with Hashem requires us to be aware of our smallness in relation to Hashem's greatness. So may these days of elevation of the Sfirata Omer offer us an elevation specifically through that which is hidden, through acquiring humility and connecting ourselves to the most hidden part of us, which is our neshama, she too is hidden from sight, humble and holy. May this time of elevation afford us a connection of self and to Hashem so that we could arrive at Shavuot, not only with the merit of counting the days of the Omer, but that we made each day of the Omer count. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'll- Wow. Uh, wow, Ravitson, thank you. I, uh, I'm i very, very grateful for the message that you shared with us. I want to give an opportunity, if it's okay, to open it up. If anybody has any questions or thoughts or something that they would like to share, you can either post it on the chat if you don't feel comfortable to unmute yourself, or you can go ahead and, and ask um, the Ravitson here right now you have the opportunity to do so. I want to 
in, in, in I'm waiting as I'm waiting for people if they want to share something. I just want to share one thing that came to my mind as you were speaking uh, with so much passion and just it was ab absolutely incredible. Uh, really, very very different way to see a parak that I've read so many times and never understood it in that kind of way. It was funny this week. I received a message from one of my former students. I used to be a teacher. I was teaching Torah for seven incredible years. Wow, my God, so many years ago, it's ridiculous. And a student of mine sent me a, a WhatsApp message this week with a picture. She took a picture of a Sidur, inside of Sidur. Basically, I, uh, as a teacher, at the end of every month, I would do a raffle in class and I would give away, you know, a Sidur because Tefillah was something I spoke about very, very much and connection to Hashem is something I spoke about very much. And I would write them a little, a, a note in their Sidur, whoever won the Sidur. And so she sent it to me and she sent it, and it was from May 6, 2009. And she still has the Sidur and it's all, you know, taped up because she's using it. And I was looking at the message I wrote in there and, it, 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 um, and I was thinking of it as you were speaking and one of the lines I, I wrote to her, and I, I found it as you were speaking, I said, she said, I said, as you begin to pray from the Sidur, remember that the greatest power of B'nai Yisrael is within our tefillot, just like we've learned in class, Hakol Kol Yaakov. And the reason I was ah, thinking that very nice. is because right, the Pasuk, Hakol Kol Yaakov Vayadai Mideh Esav. And one of the things I, I was, I was always, you know, tell my students that the beautiful thing is, you know, yes, the adimer of Esav, and perhaps it's more on the, the physical aspect, or maybe they're, you know, Esav is coming at us, or you're being, you know, harmed in whichever way. But the, the, the greatest power that we have is our call. Where's the call come from? It comes from our nishama. It comes from a nishama. And the call, if we use it properly, it has the ability to influence the hand of Esav in every which way. So yes, the hand of Esav could come at us, but Hashem gave us Hakol Kol Yaakov. He gave us this power of, of speech to utilize our, our words, our words of kindness, our words of love. Our words have the ability to influence the hand in a tremendous way. And just like our words, right? It's coming from the Neshama. We're talking about the Neshama is very, very much connected to fire, right? We're in the night of Lag Ba'omer. We're going to go around. We're seeing fires all over the place. And what happens when you look at a fire? It's constantly moving. It's, you know, it's moving. But we also know that there's a, that, right? Just like our neshama, it's, it's, it's moving. Fire has the ability to bring light, great aura. But unfortunately, if it's used wrong, fire has the ability to destroy. It has the ability to spread so rapidly, you don't even realize it, that suddenly, boom, something can be completely wiped out and destroyed. That power is the power of the neshama. It's how we utilize it. Our words, they are so key. And it says it in the Bible, Hakol Kol Yaakov. You want to know how to handle Esav? You want to know how to tap into your power. Tap into that incredibleness that's within us, that's hidden within us. The hand you write, you can see. The coal, you can't see the coal. Who could see the coal? And, you know, it's uh, what you share really just... Uh, it touched me deeply and it made me think of this of this concept. So I, I just wanted to share that, Rabbitson. Thank you so much for sharing. You're certainly right. There's nothing really to add. Chutz from the fact that every call out there makes a difference. And it's not just the call of uh, Yaakov that Davins or learns. Chachamim say it's the call that's actually representing Hashem properly. So mashal, if you're not using your voice properly in the sense of if you're speaking Lashonara with that call, and then you went and you davened and you said Teilim, mm, that kind of is very conflicting. Or uh, if you don't see it, things in a positive way and you always have ta'anot, you always have complaints, you're never able to say thank you. That kind of clashes with the other call, which is the call of tefillah. So we have to always make sure that the kolot of Yaakov, that's why it says, a call, call Yaakov. It could have said, a call Yaakov, the voices of Yaakov. Yeah, and that's not what Yitzhak said. He says, the voice is the voice of Yaakov, which means that Yaakov was living his life. Both voices were the same, the voice of spirituality and the voice of living. The way he personified himself was identical. That's, that's by the way, the same idea that we have with Avraham Avinu, 
towards the towards the the end of uh, of Parashat Vayera when he takes he, uh, uh, takes his son Yitzhak right to the altar to the mizbeach. Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want him to sacrifice Yitzhak right at the last moment as he's lifting up the 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 knife. Kadosh Baruch Hu stops him. Uh, uh, a bat call comes out. Malach says, "Ah, oh, Avraham, Avraham, twice. We need to say Avraham twice." So from here we learn the Chachamim say that really, when a Kadosh Baruch Hu chose Avraham to be his humble servant, he realized that Avraham was faithful through and through. In the Shamai, a Kadosh Baruch Hu saw that this Neshama has tremendous potential. The only question is, with the, will, will the potential in the heavens match the actions here on earth? Will we, will we have this? Will we have a, a mirror image of how Hashem sees us in this world? So when Avraham finally passed the, the final test of Akedat Yitzhak, Akedosh Baruch Hu said, Avraham, Avraham, ding, 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 ding. They match, they match. Avraham, but uh, Elionim and Avraham, but Tachtonim, the Avraham of there that I had in mind and the one over here, they're one and the same. That is the lesson of Akol Kol Yaakov. Amazing, amazing. And that's why we have only one mouth because it has to be the same. Ah, they're very be speaking good. one way and we then got speak- two sets of teeth. We've got the <laughs> upper and the lower in order to make sure that we keep the, uh, they keep our mouth. Anybody have a question? Have, or a uh, Devorah, I think you, you, did you have a question that you wanted to ask Devorah? Do you give other shiurim? Yes, I do here. You could log on to www.ohelsara.com and you can uh, log on to the Shiram over there. They're audio uh, and also uh, visual. You have a choice. Anyone else have a comment or a question? I think, Devora, you wanted to say something. I'm not sure. If not, I'll oh, go ahead. Yes, you can unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry about that extra noise. And I'm sorry if I just, yeah, um, I was thinking about saying something and I was listening. Anyway, so I was just going to say what, um, what, What's your name, the speaker? Sorry. Rabbani, the Rebbetzin Kineret. Rebbetzin Kineret, yes. What she was saying about, um, I was going to mention what she just explained about um, the voice of Yaakov and how we have to have a, I was thinking, you know, about a Havis Yisrael and and, um, and using our voice, you know, not speaking Lush and hard, but having that a Havis Yisrael and all that. And as well, so, but, but I wanted to just point out as, as she, just uh, the fine point that I'm sure, and she may have touched on it anyway. Um, that um, I was um, at a meeting for Tehillim and and uh, Tefilos, uh, the community at a time that there were special Tsaras concerns going on in Eretz Yisrael. One of those times, and and um, it was at a yeshiva, the city's yeshiva, and they and the Rebbeim, one of the Rebbeim who spoke said, "We have that special relationship." With Hashem so close, the people of Yaakov, Yaakov, is much closer, much closer than Esav. So when we use our power of tefillah, asking and diving to Hashem, He hears us so well. So that helps to remember in all this. And I appreciate the tremendous cheer she gave. Thank you so much. And those points you just explained, I was just thinking about bringing out that she just did. Thank you. Thank and also you so I wrote much. a song. I wrote a song called Kol Yaakov and it brings up some of these oh, ideas. Very nice. Oh, very that's nice. beautiful. Um, thank thank you, you so much um, for sharing. I really appreciate it. And <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you uh, for your beautiful comments here. We Don't go anywhere. We are going to do our read. And uh, Rebitson, I know you haven't used Abraham's legacy. You have an opportunity. You're going to see know. a quick video. So don't worry. You're going to see a quick one. <laughs> wow, we're going to see the video now? You, you have nothing to worry. It's going to explain to you one minute exactly what we're going to do. And then we okay. have six minutes on Great. the clock. Bezrat Hashem. Great. We're 33 Great. strong here right now on Zoom. We can finish a sefer of Tehillim. So yes, yes. Grab out your 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 phone. We're going to uh, we're gonna I'm gonna share the video and we're gonna go right into the the the, the Tehillim read. Here we go. On behalf of Abraham's legacy, we are excited to lead you in a Tehillim reading, where each and every one of us, from wherever we are in the world, can easily join in and complete a book of Tehillim in unison within minutes through a very special app called Abraham's Legacy, Tehillim Together. 
in memory of Avraham ben Polin. To be part of the Global Tehillim Read happening now, download Abraham's Legacy on your mobile device from the App Store, available for iOS and Android. You can also scan this QR code with your phone. To scan a QR code, simply open the camera on your phone and hold it up to this image. A link will appear on top, which you can click, and it will direct you to download the app. I'll give you all a moment to download the app. Sign in, and in a minute, we will all click on the Start Reading button on the main screen, and each of us will receive a different peric from the Sefer of Tehillim so that we can complete the book and add to the global count. In the top right corner, you can click the icon to switch your language if you like. You'll also be able to see in real time the amount of people reading and countries reading. Don't forget, you'll need to confirm that you've completed the chapter. Let's put a few minutes on the clock to read in unison so that we can unleash the power of our combined tefillah. Tiskul mitzvot. Shabbat <laughs> 
יש אוצר שמציק לצאן, ואין ציר שיצעק לצאן. רק אני מול ים שלם ולב שבור. ורק אתה יכול להפוך מספדי למחול, לזכך את החול, לרכך בי הכל. ורק אתה... And you can go ahead and... You can finish up the, the pedic you're on. We are so close to the end of the Sefer. <laughs> we are in the Shira Ma'alot, so we're really, really close to finishing the Sefer. You can, of course, you can access this at any time. It doesn't have to only be during the Shurim. You come, you click, you read one pedic, you're part of completing an entire book uh, on a daily basis. It's a tremendous, tremendous thing. I also want to mention, not to forget, that at the end of the festival, which is going to be May 22nd, we will be holding an exciting raffle Uh, I sent a video in the emails that you've been getting. Uh, it includes copies of books from our speakers. It includes the 100% pure copper in a tila cup. I've seen it the Kotel. It includes a free tour of the, of the city of David of Ir David, for those of you that are in Eretz Yisrael, and many more things. To enter the raffle, all we ask is to make a, a donation of a minimum of $18 to Abraham's legacy. And you can also enter when you dedicate a chapter to Tehillim for you or your loved one. You might have noticed that when you're reading Tehillim right now on the app, That some of the perakim have at the top that it's dedicated for the memory or for the healing of somebody. So what does it mean? Basically, when you dedicate a chapter, you can do so for the week or for the month. And then your loved one's name is going to appear on that perak for all of our app members. That's 20,000 strong. So we're finishing hundreds of books in a month. So think of all of those zechuyot. And when you dedicate a chapter, you will also be automatically entered into the raffle. Uh, you could see a full list of the raffle prizes in the video that's sent to you in the emails as well as on our website. And the link to donate or to dedicate a chapter is in the chat, or you could go to abrahamslegacy.com slash donate. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always reach me via email, uh, via WhatsApp. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. I want to remind all of you, we are not here tomorrow, 
but we are back again on Wednesday with our speaker, Mrs. Chaya Bracha Rubin, who is going to be focusing on chapter 113. Uh, and she's going to be speaking about Halel, Hod, and Akarat Habayit, Amuna, Acceptance and Gratitude. So uh, we hope to see you there. And if you, in case you miss it, don't worry, there will be recordings as well as today's. I want to just thank uh, the Rabbanit for her time, for her words, for her passion. Uh, thank you so much, Rabbanit. It was really pleasure. a pleasure having you here. My pleasure, and it's a school to be here. And I have to ask you, that first song that was playing when yes. the Tehillim was going, what's the name of that song? The first one, not the second one. And then the name, second The name of the song, I'm going to have to send it to you because I- Send it I to, to me. I really it liked it a lot. I do have, just so that you know, well, both of these songs, the acapella songs, they are not the, the, the person that's singing it is not the actual original I, I, writer I of the song. I know. But I will send you the yeah. name of the song as well. Just send me the name of the song. Yeah, it was it. really I was, good. I liked it. it. Fantastic. I, I know it, it really makes Eileen. me, I, honestly, whenever, the truth is it's fine. Whenever I, 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 I say to Eileen, I put music like this on in the in the background because for me, well, that's really Tehillim was it was connected to music. Obviously, it was all with music. But when I when I listen to music like this, it allows my tefillah to go even deeper because it it takes you to another level. It makes you sure. helps you to feel things that you you you. It's hard to explain in words, really. Sure, sure. But uh, sure. thank you so much, everyone. Remember, remember tefillah. It changes us, and when we change. Our entire world changes. I will see you. Hey, Jessica Savage just, just wrote an amazing comment that makes me feel like a million dollars. Thanks tonight, so much. In my tonight opinion, was... she wrote, <laughs> tonight she said in my wow, opinion, wow, was the crown wow. jewel of the whole program. Jessica, you made my night. You made my week. You made my Shabbos. <laughs> I, thank I have, you. <laughs> I have to say one thing I forgot. I wanted to mention this and I'm so happy. You just called out Jessica's name. Okay. Jessica okay. happens to be just an incredible person, a really amazing friend and somebody who has been just as tremendous support for me, Jessica. <laughs> and I hope it's okay that I'm mentioning this right now, but Jessica started a blog and I would love for you to post it here. I will, I will. Okay. Put it in the email reminders that go out tomorrow. You'll see it there. The email reminders go out on Wednesday. So you will see it. But please check it out. She wrote a beautiful entry for Lagba Omer that I think will touch uh, many of you. So uh, Jessica, I'm going to ask you to post your, your link here on the chat. Uh, if you don't end up managing to place it here before we get off, not to worry. It will be in your inbox. Everyone will be in your inbox on Wednesday. You'll have it and you'll have the opportunity to read it. But she's a fantastic Kine person Kine with a huge heart. Kine 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 uh, thank you, Chaya. <laughs> okay. Yes, Chaya. Chaya, yeah. no, Chaya is an old Talmida of mine. For, I know her since she's in ninth grade. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Kiner at. Kiner Thank you. At. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Have a great rest of your night and looking forward or day and looking forward to seeing all of you on this coming Wednesday. Take care. <laughs>